economy is crashing. Stocks are down, crypto is down, discretionary spending is down, everything is down. If this keeps up, I'll have to be a visual astronomer. Now, my YouTube stats tell me that 84% of you don't understand sarcasm, so that last bit was a joke. As we go through this economic retail winter, we might be interested in products that are under $500. That's right, it breaks the 500 rule by being less than 500. But are they crap? Well, there's a lot of products under 500 that will actually take your astrophotography to the next level, or at least they're things that should be in your astrophotography toolkit. On this channel, I help you take photos of space. Not just those crap photos of space you take on your iPhone, but actually proper acquired images through careful data acquisition, image calibration, and post-processing. G'day, my name is Dylan O'Donnell from Byron Bay Observatory, and you're watching Star Stuff. Here's the thing, you absolutely do not need an electronic autofocuser to succeed in astrophotography. But if you're feeling fancy, you know, go out and get yourself one. The ZWA EAF is obviously very popular right now, but there are other ones here that I will leave links to in the description. Now, once you have autofocusing set up, it means you can just push a button and it will find the V curve and you'll be in focus. Now, electronic focusing may be essential if you're trying to automate everything, but it is a bit of a luxury if you don't have to automate everything. It just means you don't have to go outside to fiddle with your knob. You can sit inside and fiddle with your knob. Look, I know this isn't very sexy, but I've got to say it. I've got a huge, fully automated observatory in the backyard. However, all of that just stops working if the cable breaks. And there have been nights where I've wasted an entire night because a power cable is out or I just needed to swap USB cables, something stupid like that. Spare power leads, ancient kettle lead, which we call a kettle lead for some reason. Get spare USB 2 cables, spare USB 3 cables. Spend like 50 bucks on stocking up on cables so that if you ever have an emergency, you have something to fall back on. A wise man once said, the great thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. You need to have a set of spaces of all different sizes and you need to have a set of adapters going between things, male, female, M42, M54, M48. Unless you plan on having one telescope and one camera for the rest of your life, there's gonna be a point where you need to change cameras. And this is especially painful if you have a mix of ZWO and QHY cameras. QHY have this crazy series of adapters that you need to use and special spaces. Even though I have a literal drawer full of spaces and adapters, even though I've kept every single adapter that ever came with a camera, for some reason the night that I need to connect something to something else, I can never find the thing I need. Just buy a bunch, have them ready to go. Okay, finally a product which is a bit sexier than cables and spaces. If you have $500 burning a hole in your pocket, you should get a Star Trek amount. And I don't mean like a big equatorial mount for massive deep sky observation. I mean something that you can just whack a DSLR on. There's a lot of these sort of cheaper, low level equatorial and even go-to mounts now with the Star Adventure, a go-to version, uh, which you can use for small holidays, little trips, something to just throw in the car. And you can still do all of that deep space exposure stuff just at smaller focal lengths. So so instead of your regular wide field just setting up on a static tripod and taking a long exposure of the sky, you can start tracking the rotation of the Earth. So you're tracking the stars as well and that allows you to take longer exposures which you can then stack and process and get some really beautiful deep space images. You're not ready to jump right into solar astrophotography because the gear costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, but if you have a few bucks, you can just buy some solar film. You don't need to buy expensive glass plate filters, though you can if you want to. But if you just get some film, you can actually put that over your existing telescope. And that will allow you to image the sun in white light. That means you'll see sunspots if there are details on the sun. But if you do want to spend that whole $500 and get some surface detail as well, then you can get a solar continuum filter. This small filter will actually help reveal the granulation on the surface of the sun. So this will essentially convert your existing telescope, your nighttime telescope, into a daytime solar telescope. It's not as good as a full HA hydrogen tuned telescope for solar, but you can resolve surface detail and all for under 500 bucks. Okay, this one's even less sexy, but if you don't have it, you need to. You need a good anti-static cloth. You know when you're buying a camera or something from a shop, 
always ask them to just throw in an antiseptic cloth. It might be there on the counter, five bucks or whatever. Just ask them to throw it in because you can never have enough. Have these lying around because there will come a time when you need to clean the dust off your sensor. And everything you have, cameras, adapters, filters, should all be in sandwich bags. Because it really is good to put your expensive stuff somewhere where human hands have never made contact before. And these sandwich bags straight out of the factory really do the job. It's not sexy, but you should do it. You know what's even better than a big telescope? An even bigger telescope. And the main reason people buy dew shields is to make their telescope look twice as big as it actually is. It's a cheap investment for that big thick upgrade. And of course it prevents dew. So if you are in a climate where the ambient temperature drops below the dew point and dew falls or forms on the glass of your telescope, it's a real lifesaver. A dew shield and a dew heater, probably a good idea. Everything is better with lasers. Are you even a real astronomer if you don't have a laser pointer? Uh, this is especially good for visual astronomers who need to point things out to the general public when you're out doing outreach with a telescope or with your naked eye and you just want to point to something. Now here in Australia, we don't have constitutional freedoms to be able to just walk around with firearms and lasers are treated like firearms, particularly ones that are handheld. But the legal loophole here in Australia is that if you're an astronomer, if you're a member of a registered astronomical society, you can import a laser pointer. So you should. And if you've got $500 to spend on a laser pointer, whew, you are going to get a good laser pointer. And another legal pro tip, if the laser isn't handheld, if you can plug it in, which of course makes it an even stronger laser, that's technically not a laser pointer because it's not handheld. So while you're out buying a uh, laser pointer, you can buy yourself a desktop laser as well, just for, you know, fun. Because everything is better with lasers. Now, you would think with everything I just said about electronic autofocusing, you wouldn't need a button of mask. Button of masks were invented by a Russian astronomer and a really great guy as far as I can tell. But until the war is over, I will call them Zelensky masks or maybe freedom masks. But seriously, if you do want to focus and you're second guessing yourself or you're doing planetary and you're just not in your DSO software doing an autofocus run, a button off mask is actually really handy, really useful and a relatively new addition to the astronomy toolkit only invented not so long ago. If you don't have a button off mask, they are really cheap to produce. Uh, you can 3D print one yourself if you want to, or just shell out a few bucks and get one. A really nice solid plastic one. It doesn't cost much and it's a really great thing to have. Shout out to R Astrophotography on Discord who also agreed with me with this particular number one. And that is just one really good filter. In my case, I would spring for the best hydrogen alpha filter you can find. Get one with the narrow band pass. But if you're using a color camera, go for one of the tri-band filters or go for one of the dual band filters, something that will really make your nebula pop. At the end of the day, the broadband color stuff or the other filters that you use, sulfur, oxygen, if you're using illuminance as the main detail layer in your image, you want that particular layer to be better than the others. So if you do have $500 burning a hole in your pocket, you're not gonna go out and buy a whole new rig or a whole new telescope or a whole new camera invest that money in a really good filter it is the number one thing that will make the most improvement to your astrophotography and get the best results possible i hope you enjoyed this video and here's an image i just finished terribly happy with the star colors but the actual luminosity I am really really happy with it and in part due to that one good filter that I have in my case a beta f2 tuned ha filter which works just great at f7 as well so really happy with that result I hope your astrophotography journey is going well remember to tag me in your images I do love it when I see that subscribe if you feel like it I don't really care but I do dive deeper into the weeds in some of the more technical astrophotography things now and then but the algorithm tells me you like lists so I hope you enjoyed this good list. Uh, my name is Dylan O'Donnell from the Byron Bay Observatory. You've been watching Star Stuff. Remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die.